Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Harrisburg City Council Legislative Session, Tuesday, April 10, 2018. I'm calling this meeting to order at 6 o'clock. Mr. Petrosky, please do the roll call. Mr. Allett? Present. Ms. Daniels? Here. Ms. Green? Present. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Here. Ms. Williams? Here. And please note for the record that Mr. Madsen is excused. Thank you. Moving on to the invocation, Councilman Majors, please. Um, I'd just like to, for everyone to uh, bow their heads in a moment of silence. Uh, this is our first meeting since uh, the remembrance of the 50th, uh, the remembrance of, since it's been 50 years since the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, and we continue to still fight for uh, the efforts that he led in nonviolence and looking to bring all people together. So if we'll have a quick moment, brief moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Majors. Moving on to Pledge of Allegiance. Councilman Johnson, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank you on MBE and WBE and DBE assessment. Mr. Woolley. Madam President, members of council, uh, thank you. I uh, want to come before you and give you uh, an update on some of the review that we've been doing uh, on this topic regarding disadvantaged businesses. We know that it's a, an important issue for the city and for council and for the administration. Um, wanted to come to you and give it a, a program, uh, but we're giving you a snapshot right now because we're develop what we're developing is a program. Uh, stems from uh, a review of our policies and procedures uh, and looking at them and seeing if we could update them, uh, make them more relevant and make them more user friendly to encourage uh, disadvantaged businesses and businesses generally to come in and, and do work for the city. We're about to have a, a big capital spend and it's important and we heard uh, the concerns of council and the administration to make sure that we were able to review this and come to you with uh, what we have uh, in terms of uh, uh, the program as it currently is, uh, was, and some of the uh, uh, changes that, that, we've, that we've done. So helping me with this uh, is Charles White uh, uh, and Shoshone. Um, and Jackie and Wayne. Uh, we've been working at this for uh, a few months now. Uh, so I'll give you a timeline of what, what we've been doing. And the, first off, we'll start off with the program. Um, and there are three objectives of, of, of this type of program that I think we're, that are important. Um, there's the business certification and removing any impediments uh, regarding how a business can get certified. And you'll see uh, later on in the presentation how we've done that. Uh, our uh, the City of Harrisburg certification process was a little bit cumbersome, so we've, we've addressed that. Also, uh, another objective uh, is business development uh, and really assisting um, small business in getting them up and running, introducing them to um, uh, general business uh, ways of how, how, do, how their business needs to function and things like that and making sure that they are in tune to that and that we offer our assistance where we can or direct them to um, uh, folks that have that information. Uh, but again, uh, the, 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 another objective is that what we don't want to do is set people up for failure. We also want to be there as a support network. And so it's important that this program also be one where they become part of the supply chain, where the, they, they, they can start out as a small business, um, and then they move up to sub, and then, then become a prime. But we have to be there in those intervening stages to help them along to get to each, each level, uh, and make sure that the primes currently will look at them um, and seek to hire them when the projects come, come, come online. So like I said, there's a, there, we've been, um, listening to council and the administration about uh, the importance of this uh, subject. We started in December, early December. Uh, we held some meetings 
uh, really to outline what our current procedure was and get uh, get our arms around that. And we did that. Uh, part of the so part of the the changes that we were able to do immediately is we um, we had uh, we appointed uh, Charlie as the leader of the disadvantaged business uh, uh, for the community. Uh, I think it's it's really part of his job function now as director. Um, and you, I'm not going to read all these. You can read them for yourselves. But you can see that uh, we changed the way we. Did, Procurement, in, in particular, is really we had to take a look at procurement and see where the bottlenecks were, mm -hmm. uh, and in that process, uh, also some of the failings that we were have. So, what we were able to do um, is to mirror some of the things that have been done in the city already, uh, especially in the uh, in housing. Where in housing, uh, especially in the in the lead program. There's 100% participation in minority businesses in terms of lead remediation. So using some of their te techniques and, and, and uh, that they had implemented, uh, we rolled them out and we're doing them citywide now. So we're, for instance, um, taking advantage of what's already out there. Um, we're inter going out into the community, uh, partnering with uh, other entities that are, are already doing these types of programs. Uh, and um, you can see that uh, Charles and Sushan have been actively gone out uh, into the community, uh, introducing themselves, introducing the city of Harrisburg to how we do business, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that they we're there as a resource for the vendors that want to do business with the city, and changing some of the the, the, the old stereotypes of the, the the city of Harrisburg with regard to our payment process and, and things like that, and really introducing them uh, to the new city of Harrisburg. Um, now, with regard to this next slide, this is a snapshot. This is statistically, it doesn't really mean anything, right, because we haven't gone through the whole analysis. But what I can tell you from this snapshot is we decided that we were going to take a look back of three years at all the vendor payments made by the city of Harrisburg. So right now, at this point, we've gone through, and it's a manual process. We've gone through A through G. Um, and we have cross-referenced those vendors on a number of sites to see if they were registered with any third party as a disadvantaged business. And so what we've done is we're able to come up with a spend over those three years total spend of about $12.2 million. And of those of that contingent, there's about $1.1 million that we can verify that's been spent with uh, disadvantaged businesses. So like I said, it's not statistically valid yeah. because we haven't gone through the whole <clears throat> process of analysis. But we wanted to bring you what we were able to do and let you know why it's kind of cumbersome for us to do. Because just take one example. If you take one company. Let's say it's woolly plastering. Then we go online and we, we look to see at all the different sites that they could be certified to, to look and see if they're actually certified. So we have to do that. So we're continuing to do that. Um, and we'll come back a little bit later and update you on the whole three-year spend and how much money was spent by the city of Harrisburg and how much was uh, spent uh, specifically with disadvantaged businesses. Um, but that's, that, that's a look back. So we've, we're talking about process changes. And uh, we'll, we can get specific about some of the process changes that we're currently doing. Um, we have uh, the, the, we had a minority business directory. Um, and it wasn't as inclusive as it should have been. <clears throat> so what we've done, we've, we've expanded it to include more um, groups. Uh, that could be that are labeled disadvantaged, and as 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 part of that, we actually have the the directory, uh, and part of our goal is to get that to each of the departments, so that they have this list, so that when they are preparing uh, an invitation for bid, that they make sure that um, uh, they look at this list and and are able to shoot that out to those businesses. 
Um, we've also streamlined some things in terms of online. Uh, we've made some changes to the uh, application process. We've made it a seamless doc. It's online. Um, but Charles can, can and Shashan can get more into that. Um, and we're also utilizing social media. Uh, we hadn't been doing that in the past, so we're, mm -hmm. with the Office of Communication, we're making sure that the invitation for bids are, are, are disseminated via that, um, as well as being on pen, uh, pen bid and pen live. Um, so, uh, so those are the current process changes that, we, that we've done, some of them. Um, we also have a prioritization list that Sean has compiled, so that uh, she worked in conjunction with the uh, procurement department, and when the, when the solicitations are about to go out, she gets them and she sends them out to a, an ever-expanding group of vendors uh, that uh, we, we currently have, in addition to the list that we've compiled, uh, the directory, uh, to make sure that uh, um, the most uh, that we that we are able to get these bids out to the most uh, vendors as possible. Um, but there's going to be, in terms of next steps, there's going to be to, there's going to have to be a training aspect too. So we're going to have to train the departments on the new procedures. We're going to codify that. We're going to get those out to the the, the department. I'm going to hold. Uh, meetings in conjunction with Charles, Shoshone, and Jackie to make sure that everybody understands what we expect of them and that they can relay that, what we expect of our vendors. And I think that's, that's the important part, to make sure that we are in constant communication about what our expectations are uh, with regard to this important topic. Um, and we want to make sure that we have good communication with council and administration to make sure that you have good data on these. So we're going to be monitoring our, our vendors. Um, and we actually have a, um, there is a sheet uh, that we have, that we're going to, we, we have piloted in, two, in three um, uh, departments. The pilot sheet that we have. The monitoring. We, yeah. Um, well that, at least for minority vendors as, as far as just tracking the participation levels. So what we would do with uh, each, yeah, it's like- The, the good faith, faith efforts form, that's what it is. It, it escaped me. So we have a good faith efforts form that, we, that we're, we've that we implemented and piloted in three departments so far. Uh, we have to train those departments on how to use those, and it's really following, being able to follow up on each bid to make sure that our requirements are being followed and that they say they hired five disadvantaged businesses and they're expecting that each of these businesses should have X amount of dollars that they're actually getting those dollars. So we have to, we have a little bit of responsibility in terms of monitoring uh, and making sure that the, the goals are being met. So these are things that in response to some of the concerns that uh, City Council had, we, we, we implemented. Um, in addition, um, we are going to use and expand the mandate of the pre-bid uh, conferences. And so this is the interaction that procurement and the departments are going to have with potential bidders to make sure that they understand that uh, this procurement aspect is very important to the city of Harrisburg and the way we want to do business. Now, we, we have goals. Um, we're, not, we're not going to mandate certain percentages. We're going to express to them that we'd like to see a certain amount. Um, and make sure that we're open to all vendors and businesses, and we want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, but that's what we're doing now, and that's some of the, 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 the changes that we have made in response to some of the concerns. But I think what really is driving some of this is that we are talking about some of the big capital spends that are coming. And the one that's right now is the Third Street multimodal project. Mm -hmm. So there have been, excuse me, there have been a lot of um, innuendo and a lot of inf people of talking about levels of participation. So what we wanted to do is make sure that we did a deep dive into the numbers themselves. And, uh, and this is part of the communication piece that I just referred to. 
of us being able to, uh, as, as the administration and departments, to be able to relay what actually is going on. So if we take a look at this project itself, you see there's three design, there's three city contracts that this, this project is made up of. There's a design phase, which is Wallace and Montgomery. There's a construction management and specs phase, which is urban engineers. And a construction phase, which is Doug Lamb construction. So if we go to the design, right now the cost of that is almost, almost $400,000. And the source of funds is the city general fund. And the DBE participation uh, is at almost 15%, which is amount to almost $60,000 in that. Then we take uh, the construction management inspection phase, and the cost is about $350,000, and the source of funds was Impact Harrisburg. And the DBE spend so far is about $41,000, and that percentage is 11.5%. So there's a little bit, um, and then we get to the construction phase. This is where the, there's some big dollars here. The city cost is about $3.5 million. Uh, the source of funds, uh, about three quarters of a million dollars is from Impact Harrisburg, and then PennDOT is about $2.5 million. DBE spend, as you can see, is 208000 uh, 209. And that's about 3.8%, uh, almost 4%. Um, but what I like to say is that we've been hearing that we're below 1% in terms of our participation. And from our look at the numbers, it, that's not the case. There's a lot of room for improvement in terms of um, if we want to increase the percentages. But what we're doing uh, is we're making sure that we, we actually know uh, what our spend is and who's getting that. And so the, th this gives you a little bit of, of an idea of, for this particular project and the numbers here as opposed to some of the anecdotal um, uh, figures that have been bandied about. So we'll get, and now let's go into these specifically. Let's talk about the construction. So there's currently six uh, DBE contracts. Uh, to provide labor and or material. material. Um, the construction contractor sent solicitation to 24 different DBE subcontractors and suppliers. Five were hired, uh, 15 gave no response. Um, three were in the middle of pricing and one had a conflict. Um, but I think another important um, aspect of this, and I spoke to um, Ms. Ford about this, uh, and, and we, we were talking about how do we, what other avenues or ways are there to uh, ensure that there's, um, in, that w there's an inclusionary aspect to uh, the spend on these projects. Well, you can see with the labor force in terms of, for Doug Lamb that 53% uh, are minority workers. But more importantly, 47% of the work hours of that project have been completed by those workers. So um, there's different ways that you can have uh, uh, inclusion and, and on a project and on a contract. And I think that's one way that we can we can we can do it, and that one way we are doing it. Um, and so uh, right now, you know, we're looking at the cost of this this project is about 6.2 million dollars, and it stands that the DBE Participation is about three hundred nine thousand dollars, which represents about five percent um, um, DBE. Uh, and Impact Harrisburg, I think they are, they 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 are very concerned about how their dollars are being spent, and they were concerned that it was under one percent. Now on this project, it's about seven one seven point one percent. And um, if you go by project to date and the spend of uh, DBE funds is about 12%. So these numbers, uh, while uh, we can all probably say that we need, need, need some improvement, it's, it's vastly different, different than what was portrayed um, only a few weeks ago. And so uh, with some of the changes that we've, we're implementing, we're hoping going forward that will help other projects lift uh, those percentages. Um, and I know that we've, we've, we've discussed with Impact Harrisburg the, the, the idea of having uh, some assistance with uh, this pro project in particular. 
uh, in terms of monitoring and, and, and uh, uh, having the DBE participation elevated. Uh, we're open to that right now. We have uh, urban engineering uh, engineers, excuse me, uh, that is uh, part of our monitoring process uh, with regard to uh, these goals. Uh, so I, my, my, my thought is to have, uh, if, the, if that is made available to us, we'd have to sit down uh, with, with that consultant and urban engineers and sit down and see what we can do in order to lift um, some of these percentages. But let me, let me stop talking. I know there's probably some questions and I have um, uh, some folks that are stand ready to answer your questions. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Mr. Woolery. We, we certainly appreciate all the work that you put into this <coughs> presentation. I'm just sorry it came at a time when we needed the information a week ago, and, and what happened is that uh, Impact Harrisburg came in and actually gave the city a push. So are we still in noncompliance, or are we in compliance? Have we reached, have we found a noncompliance, I mean a compliance uh, officer yet? Uh, the. the no, I don't think we've hired one. But I think we're. Are we looking to do that? Students. Are we looking to do that? Well, we what what we're what we're doing is, uh, I think that we have to talk to the. I'll talk to the mayor about that. But the duties of the compliance officer are being spread uh, between my office, um, also Charles' office, and we're relying heavily on Shoshone oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> to help us do that. Uh, I think, you know, we're mindful of. Um, the spend in terms of bringing on new people, and we want to see if we can, uh, with the current contingency, if we can handle it. If not, then we without can. a compliance officer, you you intend to handle it yourself. Well, is that what you're it's saying? A it's a team effort. Oh, okay. Team effort. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Because we haven't been doing that, and all of a sudden we're doing that. We're 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 taking those steps to make sure that we have um, to be in compliance. Once Harrisburg Impact came in and gave us a presentation. Well, I think that and it, I think, I, well, I, this started back in December. Okay. I mean, as you, as you indicated, it has, but what progress has, you, has been made, you, you've never informed city council as to date on this project. Yes, because I have to tell you, and this is not an excuse. <laughs> we've asked, we've asked several meetings and, we've I, asked I, for I, I, and a report. And, and I have to, I have to tell you that it would have been my uh, preference to be able to give this to you much sooner. Mm -hmm. But as I said, a, Diving into the the the, the information uh, is literally a manual process, and it takes a lot of time to extract this data. Okay. Um, and also, I think that we have to be mindful that we're also looking for we're looking at um, some legislation that is is about 15 years old. So yeah. I, I think there it needs to be refreshed as well. Um, so we have to take a look at that with, with city council and we sit down and we decide what goals are important now and what levels they should be. Um, so I think <clears throat> that, that's, a, that's a next step into, in this program is kind of is to look at that and to see, I think, built into the legislation as written now is a, is a compliance component. Um, and so let's see if we can use that as, 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 a, as part of the compliance effort. So my, my, the goal here is really to work with city council to develop a plan and a path forward and the administration at, to really um, address the needs of now, uh, to be more inclusive, to, to have uh, what I think are going to be um, levels of participation that, one, are achievable, but I think we're stretching a little bit. It's good to stretch to see if we can, but we have to make sure that they are achievable. Um, and I'm not saying that the goals as currently written are, not, are, are or are not, but I think we have to have a discussion about that and we have to see what other cities are doing in terms of levels of participation, what other analytics go into the algorithm that will present itself to the council as to what is the appropriate level of, of our ask. Um, so I, I think that's where we are. Um, we're continuing to improve our process and procedure in terms of making sure that we are out there, uh, we are doing what we can to support the businesses, and that this will become a, a, a business development program um, as opposed to a disadvantaged business um, program. And that's all well and good, but are you modeling your um, goals after other municipalities that are in an urban area? 
We, that, I, that I have to tell you, we're, what we're using now is the legislation as written. What I would hope is that if, if we can get into um, a discussion with council about those goals, we would look to see what analytics are being used by similar size urban um, cities. Uh, that shows improvement on their WBE, DBE. And if, if, if I could, and I'm sorry for interrupting, but. That's fine. Uh, they are, the state level is doing a disparity study right now, okay. currently. Uh, so that will probably give us a better idea okay. of, you know, some of these numbers as far as what we're looking at right now. Okay. Because yeah. you can make numbers work any yeah, way you, you want to. So I'm concerned about these numbers. Okay. Believe me. Yeah. You make numbers work any way to make you look good. So I want to make sure that these are going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. The information you give me, we still, what you gave me, is still under the minority participation. is very low. Very, very low. We have to do a better job. That's it. We're telling you, you have to do a better job. Agreed. And I have a lot of questions, but I'll let the other council members go. Um, Ms. Green? Um, right now, I don't have too many questions. It's good to see some follow-up and some actual response to what we said. Um, I like to see hard numbers, but uh, as President Williams said, numbers can be worked however you want. I know in college, sometimes you write those papers and you'd want your thesis to be right, so you'd work those numbers the way you want it to. So I'm not making any accusations that's what happened, but um, it's good to see hard numbers, but I'd, I'd like to continue to see follow-up and see these numbers increase. So as of right now, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Johnson. Um, thank you guys for providing um, the presentation. Um, I guess if we just start on maybe kind of an easier one, two, three, four, slide five on the snapshot, I guess that has like the breakdown of like the total spend. Um, when can we, when, I know it's a manual process, I know it's a um, labor and intense process as well, as well. It's a snapshot, so I'm sorry, I think it's five or six. Um, when, when can we expect to kind of see the complete snapshot of of assessing these numbers overall? Well, I can tell you originally my goal was to have this done by uh, mid-April, uh, mm -hmm. but it's a, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a long process. And that's mm -hmm. that, that, and so my, I think we have to extend that a little bit. Um, you know, I'd like to go to mid-May and hopefully we can have this, have, have the full mm -hmm. three-year spend. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I think this is, what I'm kind of interested in is not just, um, the reason why I, I really wanted to see the complete year, because, um, cause this, I mean, this was something originally, like, I put into an email and kind of asked for, but I'm interested to kind of see it, like, by department. You see what I'm saying? Once, once it's completed by all, for all years, we can see by department and kind of truly see where the opportunities lie, just as you spoke right. in, in regards to um, the housing department with their lead program, they have 100% different techniques that are going there, but I think it's, a good approach to it, which I see done in um, other urban cities, is you know being able to assess by department, knowing w um, what areas have disparities. Like you may not have a lot of minorities do in this type of work, but you may have it in this type of work. Right. So being able to set realistic goals based upon um, you know the the work that's that we foresee coming and um, being able to give guidance to department directors of what those goals are. Yeah, I, I, oh sorry. I think arbitrarily, mm -hmm. you know, based upon our ordinance, we have, we have goals that general, that I suppose it's like an all fit goal for all departments. Right. But sometimes I think just because of, um, I would say just because of apathy and just not paying attention to, towards it, no, people, I think people are not reaching the all fit goals. And because of that, you know, that's where I think we kind of took a, um, you know, depending on what department you are, your department director could be more aggressive as far as making sure we're getting to those goals. But other departments, are, you know, are trying to complete projects, and that happens where those goals can sometimes get gets missed. But being able to see a snapshot of, you know, what our total spend, the kind of setting um, those goals on a, a yearly basis, to kind of for those department directors to try to reach in procurement. I think will be a great opportunity. So having this, having this done um, before, you know, hopefully going into fiscal year 2018 will kind of help kind of set like a good bar of saying like, this is where we are. This is where by department we were able to, re that we are hitting. And, you know, you know, kudos to those who are the numbers that we would like to see. But this, these are the room for improvements based upon by department to help guide department directors. I don't think it's more 
you know, I think it's just, I think it's just a level of guidance where I hopefully mm -hmm. having Charlie with inside that role can kind of be that guidance of how to help department directors get there. But if, like I said, uh, you know, we had a presentation, if those guidance and those numbers of whatever those um, aspirational goals are, um, those requirements were not kind of being pushed down from the top, you know, then it kind of leaves it open to say, you know, if we hit, we hit, if we don't, what's what's going to happen you see what i'm saying no i agree with and, and the, but the, the 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 what we have to do is to be able to take these numbers and look at them and then take and use a scalpel with them and go department by, by department and look at their spends as you as you as you as you say and make sure they we look at areas of opportunity but also what we can do and what we've done uh, with some of the procedural changes that we've made. If we looked at housing, for instance, we've seen what they've done, they see what they've implemented in terms of how the outreach and using those citywide, those types of techniques. So it's a, it's a, it's an all-encompassing that, that, that we're driven by analytics at this point. Um, and I hear you in terms of that that you know sometimes the numbers you can you can slant them the way you want to, but I what I have learned uh, in my short time here is that we we're all trying to get the ball against, uh, across the goal line. That's a question of how, we're, how we do it. Uh, I think everybody is well intention, intention. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to focus those efforts. And so this is a way to do it. And I uh, have a great team that's working uh, with me to do it. I think it presents an opportunity to do just that. But we need time to be able to break these numbers down in order to go department by department to see where there's the opportunities and see where there's been success and highlight those and highlight those. Okay, thank you. If, can we go two more slides um, to the next steps? So I know in regards to like the first one, it talks about the good faith at first tracking form. When is that, when is that form used? Is that something that's an ongoing throughout the project? Is that something that's used in the, the Well, bidding? we have three departments. So if you, if, I don't know, you want, you want to talk about it? Well, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, the good faith effort form, uh, Put that form together for the learner process of mm -hmm. uh, monitoring. Uh, I started uh, somewhat utilizing it with with Wayne and his projects. So I think the thing just just moving forward is the monitoring piece aspect of it. So mm -hmm. we, it may require more bodies to go out to verify because that's you know one of the pieces that you want to actually see that they're um, at least minority businesses in general or just the contractor in general is doing the, the actual job. Um, I think that just that just goes to the, you know, at least the, to the monitoring piece of it. Uh, so with that, uh, with the, it, either in the, uh, the LERDA section of it, um, you know, they have those provisions as far as MBE participation. So on the form that I developed, it lists certain things um, that you need to do as far as a good faith effort. And that goes to solicitation, advertising, um, and these are all things that we talked about. And then two, um, you know, once a lot of this stuff, it, it needs to happen on the front end. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we're initially sending out the packages, um, you know, just monitoring from that standpoint and finding out what part of the packages where we can actually break down to smaller uh, scopes of work to, uh, to give out to individuals. And that, that's some of the things that we've, we've talked about and we're, you know, at least trying to discuss because for a long time, it's just been, you know, kind of siloed as far as departments doing, you know, the things that, that uh, you know, just to get along in the daily course of business day. So as we're looking at this, we're, we're finding out different departments are doing different things, and we're just trying to put everybody on the same page as far as what we expect as far as participation. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone knows who, you know, follows anything with MWB, DBs. You know, good faith effort is a very, very, very loose mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. And if you're not heavily monitoring it from even during the phone call stages where they said, hey, I sent out 24 solicitation, I got three yeses, you know, 24 people, you know, 10 didn't call me back. Even, even the verification process of that to make sure that we are actually still connecting with the follow through to make sure that these primes are actually properly soliciting um, those who are are who have the capacity to actually do the work, or um, you know, just just within this just within this process, you know, I, I you know I saw an opportunity where someone who could have 
had the ability to bid on a third street project, wasn't even solicited to bid on the bid on the contract in regards to um, just the work that they did. They just got missed inside the solicitation process. So it's it's important for us to kind of make sure that you know we are following that this process the whole way through. And I, I think it goes to speak on um, what we're talking about now, and this is what makes it you know real sensitive issues, which you know sometimes people don't want to talk about it. Is we're talking when it comes to third street project, we're talking about a contract that has already been signed. Exactly. So where we're, where we're dropping the ball is as far as knowing the different requirements that, you know, whether they're aspirational goals or not from um, Impact Harrisburg or not, um, I think there was a lot of missed opportunities in regards to uh, really trying to figure out what those numbers were going to look, look like even before signing the contract. And now we're trying to do what we can to get to that place. And usually after signing a contract, you know, it's hard to, you know, it's hard, within that, it's hard to kind of really levy, you know, we don't have too much wiggle room in, in regards to that contract once it's been executed. Um, so I just think there's different opportunities there. And then one thing I just want to touch on is, you know, I know we talked about we don't want to have any like mandatory like goals, we want to kind of right. be loose with it. Yeah. But we also have to think about, you know, when it comes to good faith effort that there should be some type of minimum that we're looking for. You, you know, while while it may not be mandatory to to be high, you know this high twenty five percent, but as far as you know, within different project, different contracts, I'm not saying that something may be written to ordinance, but within knowing that the different scopes of works that can be done, the different opportunities that we have qualified minorities out there, we as a city can look for different minimums that we're trying to hit exactly. to um, to reach to, to reach and make sure that you know, we are communicating that to our prime subcontractor. No, I, I agree with that. I think that we have to make sure that one, uh, again, we look at the numbers and see in, in terms of the the type of project and, and availability of, of um, DBEs in, in that certain, in that in the fields. Some, some are higher than others, the percentages. Um, and making sure that the where possible the outreach we can make sure that we document it and then maybe we can get if we can get feedback on why someone may not have bid um, uh, or if they bid we can maybe we can dissect that internally and, and, and see some things but again I, it's 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 a little bit driven by the numbers on, on those on sometimes um, and what we have to do in in, in Charles um, in the group actually we, we talk about this a lot and is a, is the marketing piece of it? Um, it's so important to get in front of this process and insert ourselves in front of that in, in that process. And um, Charles is doing that now, and and um, we we put uh, Wayne on alert with regard to <laughs> what, what he'll be seeing us. Um, so it's really us taking those um, positive first steps and maintaining our awareness during throughout the process and we have to be able to verify that we're going to do that as a group in terms of the compliance um, and then we're going to follow up and just in regards to the website like I was up here going to the um, I guess the certification part of it, an application mm -hmm. the application doesn't work it goes it doesn't bring up an application it brings up um, actually just a starting a business inside HPG so I, it could be a technical thing but it you no, can. I think we mentioned that last time that we're not we're okay. no longer doing the, the certification piece. What we're doing is taking the third party certifications uh, and then working on the business development aspect of it. The, the application that we had, and I, I thought I mentioned this the last time, uh, wasn't being recognized by other mm -hmm. uh, agencies. So we took that piece out of it, uh, created a vendor form uh, so you could come in and attach your verification through that vendor form. So the, ven the vendor form, I'm just saying whatever is online. Yeah. When I go to, it says MBWDB certification skill. Yeah. And then it says start the application. So you click on that link. And it goes to the brochure. And it goes to the brochure. Yeah, because we're working on that process actively. Now, we didn't want to have the certification information on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're trying to, to work on yeah, that. I'll just take it away. The, I'll just take the link because it just seems like there should be an application when there's not there. You see what I'm saying? And see, as, as we move forward, we'll, we will have just a page dedicated for and be uh, participation as far as what, um, you know, at least the processes that we're going through for the city. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'll probably, I'll probably have more questions later another time. I know I can, 
I can talk about this for a while, so I'll just pass it. So we'll, we'll, let me let me okay. let me emphasize one. It's the objectives for a diversity uh, development. So you have there's three objectives there. Um, one of them is business certification. The other is business development, and the other is business elevation. So Shoshan comp compiled these for us. Um, she's been diligent about going out and trying to get this information about what a program should look like and what the objectives are. But in and of themselves, um, and Shoshan can speak to this, but it's really that municipalities, they, they take on one of these or maybe two, but rare, rarely do they do all three. So where we're going to focus, and we're focused less on the certification process, because what mm -hmm. Charles just said, uh, it's, it's, it, it was a cumbersome process, and it wasn't widely accepted. And it takes a lot of time for a vendor to go through that process, mm -hmm. and if they're not guaranteed a contract or they've used the certification somewhere else, they might as well do it at a, at a, at another, at a, by a third party. So. We're really focusing on the business development side of it and business ele elevation. So to that point, we're going we're, we're gonna to make those corrections. We'll, I'll, I'll look at that and make sure that the link is appropriately um, titled so there's no confusion with re regard to what objectives we are pursuing. Okay. Mr. Elliott. So just, I'll try to make it as few thoughts as possible. Okay. Uh, but um, first, I. I think the business development piece, I think, is key and important to draw people in who could be a part of it. The other part that I think more about is like the actual bid process in itself. And I think we need to quantify what that means, like by perhaps the spend of the project or what we're looking for, and perhaps redefine how we put that bid out um, in terms of what are we looking to see, someone provide in a response to us, um, maybe reassess the scorecard aspect of it. How are we scoring these bids? and giving priority to what? Um, because I think sometimes, at least at that process, I think we should put the onus on the provider to tell us how they will meet an objective and the steps that they would take to do it and be able to commit to that by way of their response to us because I think it does differ based on the industry. Um, and we could set goals and we could do all those things, but I think, and we should, so I don't think we should ignore that aspect mm -hmm. of it. But I think as we score and, and put a priority, what is most important to us? Um, how were they able to respond to us and discuss their ability to um, partner or utilize diverse businesses um, and, and determine what, does it, what makes sense, you know, as a way of kind of weighting that among other criteria that we'd be looking for. Um, so I think that's got to be part of it. I, I do think a firm should be responsible, and honestly, any firm that does business with a government entity must typically respond in that. I know in years when I was submitting proposals for things, I had to, in some cases, I couldn't submit a proposal unless I already named a partner that was a maybe weeby that could do it. Um, and that was part of the bid process. Um, so I think, and, and that could qualify based on the size. I mean, if a large scale project, guess what? They better not only know what they're doing, they better list who they're going to partner with because they're used to it. Um, so let's kind of force them to play in that, that space a little bit more. Um, the other side of it, I think, and this is the hard piece, is, is the accountability piece. Because I think that's what's hard for us. And, and I think where you've seen frustration from council is that every person who wants to do business in Harrisburg comes before council and they talk about all the good things they're going to do. They're talking about how, yep, we're going to do that. Yeah. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then we don't know, number one, did they do it? Did they say what they were going to do? Did they meet the objectives we asked them to meet? Um, and you know, are they truly just giving us lip service so they can get the bid? or are they actually kind of walk in the walk and talk in the talk? So one part I think really looking at how we bid out, and the second part that I think we really need to see more of is how do we speak to kind of the accountability piece that we're holding them to what they said they would do. Um, but I do think we have more room to, I think, ask more of them up front, um, particularly in large scale projects, so they're used to it. Agreed. I, I think there's a way to go about this, and, I, and, and we are looking at it in, in, in total, um, the, the, the marketing piece, the compliance piece, um, but also we want to sit down with council to, to, to establish these goals, but we have to figure out how to do that. Right. And I think we, we know how to, or conceptually, how we would present something to you in terms of the levels, but we have to really be able to, 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 to slice the, the industries mm -hmm. um, so that you are setting expectations that one are achievable, because um, you don't want to have something out there that's 
way, you know, it's too easy to meet or it's too hard. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that goes back to, depending on the project, Agreed. allowing the firm specifically yep. to speak to it. Uh, because, you know, for instance, maybe we, we don't know after we've gone through a bid process and we go back and we look, gosh, we didn't see that degree. Why is that? You know, yep. is it something we need to adjust, something we need to dig deeper on? Um, I would put more on, uh, particularly large projects, I think we okay. can put more on them. Okay. Mr. Majors. <coughs> well, one, thank you for the information that we do have so far. Uh, to Councilman Johnson's point, I think we need more information. I don't think the current information goes far enough. That, we, that you have compiled so far. Um, another thing that I want to point out, or so you guys started off using MBE, WBE, and then we transferred to DBE. There's a, there, there are, they are three separate groups, so why are we compiling everything into DBE versus break, a breakout of those same numbers by MBE, WBE, as well as DBE? There, there's, a, there's a distinction in those three, it's not, we're not all just gonna compile them all into one little ball and then think, hey, our numbers look better now. Because that's, to me, that's the way it looks. You didn't break out MBE over that time period, you didn't break out WBE, because in our ordinances, we have goals for MBE and WBE participation. Um, so I'd like to see those numbers as well. Um, in terms of the good faith efforts tracking form, we can get a copy of that, because uh, as other members have pointed out, that's a very subjective term, um, and we need to have, to your point, having some sort of accountability piece. The only way that vendors and, and contractors, people that are willing to bid on these contracts, will continue to bid, give us the lip service, say I couldn't find anyone, and we don't know to the extent that they did that quote unquote good faith effort. So I would like that kind of information um, so yeah, if you could break those things out um, as well, you know, this, you know, this subject has been something I know we've all been harping on and uh, the more I read into the ordinances that we have on the books, the more frustration I have because we do talk about having a coordinator, having annual reports, and where are those reports? Right. So a lot of the things that we're saying we want to do, we want to change, we have things currently on the books. and. You know, a lot of times folks feel, okay, well, it's, it's on the books. We're, we don't have to report to council. We don't have to do this. Well, when, we have, when we're having this, not just this project, but we all know we're slated to spend a lot of money in the city. There's going to be a lot of investment in the city, not just at the local level, but we have a courthouse coming in from the federal government. If our, if our ordinances aren't either being followed or need to be updated, the time to do that was a year ago. But so the onus is going to be on all of us sitting at this, up here on this dais, as well as the administration to get these things done. I mean, I mean, we have a, a ordinance from 1983, an ordinance from 1985 and 2003. Uh, so both need to be, it's not do they need to be updated, they do need to be updated, and we need to take it very seriously. Like, if, if money's gonna be spent in this community, we need to, at least, if we're not even, we're not even following the ordinances we have on the books, so. Can, I, can we get that information as well? Is that possible? Yeah, the, the breakdown? Yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get that information to you. Yeah, because the numbers, like I said, the numbers, I mean, you, you made. Well, uh, I, I process it, but I, on the Third Street project, I, I, I Wayne. Can we see, I mean, some of the firms that went into that calculation were WB, some were uh, MEs. Right. We're not sure. There might have been a veterans business as well. PennDOT does not break it down. They, the federal government in transportate, federal transportation dollars uses DB, so that's what PennDOT uses. I would actually have to go and reach out to each one of the subs to determine why they got that DB certification. Was it because they were uh, a vet, a disabled veteran? Were they a women-owned business or are they minority-owned business? That's something we have to go to each uh, uh, vendor and, and determine why, why they have that. So we would. So, is there not a, national, a certification board we can pull that information from? Not in the. They're not in the database. It, it, in the database, it tells you that they have DBE, MBE, or WB, but it doesn't say. I mean, you can. Okay. If they're both, we can. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. You can. You can give. So you can give us information whether or not those. Contra. Who? What? What they're categorized as. We can do the same. 
um, research that we've done we've done for the three year span. We can we can call the vendor if we can't get the vendor, then we can do our own research and see if we can pull that information. And unless we get one hundred percent response from them, again, you're, you're statistically, you're, you're, you're at the, but we, we'll do the same type of research. That we yeah. I guess my answer is can it be done? Absolutely. Is it? I mean, it's but it's not. It's not in a database. It's it's it actually involves. But I thought ten dot. I thought in ten dot um, the state databases. I I know it can be classified DB, but they also list. I think when they're doing their because it's like a self certification through the state or whatever. And now don't you you're talking about the small business. That's, you're that's talking about DGS business. small business. Okay. I mean, that, that's, that's different. different. Yeah. Right. Um, we're talking about the Pennsylvania Unified System. Mm -hmm. So if say I was you know, a, a minority disabled veteran, say, and I want to be listed as a disabled veteran and a DBE, I would, I could do that. But if I only want to work on PennDOT jobs, I would just request the DBE okay. certification. They would roll through, and I would show up as a DBE, and obviously I'm not a women or a minority. Mm -hmm. So it could be a little bit um, skewed, but we can, we, have, we may have to reach out to vendors or, or scrub the system, but a lot of these vendors we know, so we know how they've, Obtain the certification. Yeah. Okay. Done, Mr. Majors. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll be done for now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And, and there, there was one other thing that uh, was brought up. If if there are businesses that were not solicited for like the Third Street project, like you mentioned, I would love to know who they were because we've been going through this for a long time. What about the one in New York, the Westington, Washington, Washington Dallas. Dallas. Yeah. They were solicited by both Doug Lamb and Rogel, who was a second little bidder, and they didn't want to participate. I've reached out personally to Washington Dallas on many jobs. Mm -hmm. I know they do a lot of work in the city on demo, um, but I've reached out for a lot of jobs. I know the original list back in November they weren't on there. I, I, looked through I that sent list. you this solicitation. Yeah, no, no. They weren't on there in the November. Pre, the bid list, they weren't. Yeah. We went back with a whole list that they didn't solicit before we gave Doug Lamb the contract, mm -hmm. they solicited all of those additional. And okay. Now, Rogel did solicit Washington Downing as well, and they didn't respond to either mm -hmm. Rogel or um, Doug Lamb. But like I said, if, I know you guys have a lot of connections in the business community. But then if there's somebody that was missed, I mean, there's jobs you know, going out for bid soon, and I would like to make sure that they're either in our manual exactly. or that we reach out to them directly and say, hey, this is going out. So. You know, I don't know who the prime's going to be, but come to this pre-bid meeting, come, come to all these things. I, we need to do that. Reach out. If I don't know who they are, um, or if they're not in our book or something like that, we won't be able to. Okay, it's my understanding they did, that uh, the city didn't reach out to them. So <clears throat> you're saying that you did? Um, I've reached out. I didn't reach out to them personally on the Third Street Project. They were solicited during, during the bid by the second low bidder. When we saw the, when we saw the solicitations of all the contractors and uh, we and knowing that Doug Lamb's bid um, came in with a, a commit a low commitment we said okay your commitment is very low have you reached out to these additional vendors and he, they went ahead and reached out to those additional vendors that we listed in that follow-up that was before they were awarded the contract and, and the list I sent you just to I know it's you say it's numbers, but it is important to know that when a contractor submits his bid, it's a low bid, and we can mandate that they solicit work. We can't mandate that they have a, meet a certain goal. That would it's a low bid. I know you're talking about like a, a professional service where it's a best value, or even like a ten. Uh, streetlight project where it was best value. I was saying, what, what was the streetlight project? Because I know we yeah. have a scoring sheet. Right, for that. so that was best value. So we didn't necessarily have to take the low bid. In fact, we didn't even know at the time what the total cost was when we were asking for the responses. Under the Guaranteed Energy Savings Act, we're allowed to do a best value. But most construction projects, we have to do a low bid. The only thing we can mandate is that they solicit and that they solicit enough people to cover our goal. And, you know, if they said, oh, we, we solicited, you know, a landscaper that's only 2% of the project, right? we would reject that bid. In here, they had 20, 23 companies who were solicited for specific items that would total, you know, if, if they were the contracts, it would be over the goal. Now, three, I don't know it was clear in here, were high pricing. There were three uh, DBEs 
that's, and I don't know if it's women or minority owned, that submitted pricing, and that pricing was very high, so they actually um, awarded it to a, a, a subcontractor, but that was done pre-bid. So when they submitted our bid to the, their bid to the city, it was based on the numbers they got from another subcontract. So because they relied on that subcontractor's bid when they were awarded the city contract, they have to use that subcontractor or they get into issues with that subcontractor. Now, moving forward, we are always asking them to, if we have a change in scope, if we add an element to the project that wasn't in there for some reason, we ask them to go through the same process they went through to bid. You can't just give us a price. You have to solicit a participation for that, that new item of work. It's not just hire who you want. Um, and the same thing with the tracking sheets. A lot of the tracking material testing comes to mind, hauling. Um, comes to mind. At the time, they said time, time and material at the time and a bit. Well, we didn't know what that meant, so we had to drill down. What, it, what is your budget for hauling? Okay, it's $30,000. Okay, then that needs to show up as a commitment, and if you're, you know, I mean, that's what you budgeted for hauling. It's got to be $30,000. Um, so that's why there might have been some disconnect in the early numbers. We had to um, we had to work with the contractor to firm up some of the stuff that was submitted at the time of bid. Shemaine, did you have any questions? Um, yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you for collecting all of the information you, you've collected. It's hard to know where you're headed if you don't even know where you are. So I really appreciate that. Um, but uh, how much input or how much assistance are you getting from the department directors? Because I see you constantly referencing the two of them. And this is the kind of stuff that fails if there isn't buy-in from the full, you know, the full body that that's engaged in contracting. The yeah, contracting I, the, the, as I said, there, there's going to be an, uh, an education piece of this, and so they're going to come in and, they're, and mm -hmm. actually going to sit down with the team, each director, and we're going to lay out the new program, the new policies and procedures once we have the, the, the manual put together and lay out what our um, expectations are, and then we'll follow up with them as well and be in constant con uh, contact with them during the bid process. So um, they're... Uh, uh, they they will be um, involved in the process and they will be responsive. Okay. Um, the other question I had was, um, are we doing anything like this in terms of the analysis for our city government? Like, and for our employees, for us. Uh, I know this is about contracting, whether the mm -hmm. contracting is meeting goals, but... Um, are we doing any kind of analysis about our own hiring and? You mean um, on the um, employee side, the yeah, breakdown? The, yeah. Um, I don't. I think we have those numbers because we're we're, we're yeah, mandated report. to have them yeah. and report. So I think they're available. Um, I'm unaware of any certain legislation that we have from city council. Are any requests? Not, we have a request. I no, we, we don't. I don't think we have a okay. I just want to make sure. But um, but you know, knowing kind of that information, because we, you know, uh, in terms of our role as employers, um, you know, we've had a lot of these things come up, and we still don't really have the data. We had the salary reassessment. We had like budgeting, kind of one-off conversations, et cetera, et cetera. But we really haven't had a, a thorough discussion about what the makeup of our. Um, what I can do, and I'll have to speak with Neil about this, is that we can have those reporting. We have those mandatory reporting, and we can have those categories, and I can make sure that the manner in which we present them to council is, is appropriate. So I have to talk to Neil about it. I'm just unsure of it right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's, I can be made available to you, and then we can have a discussion on um, what the numbers are. report on the EEO1 mm -hmm. category, mm -hmm. and that's, that's not a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's very subjective and it's self-identified anyway. Right. Yeah, because I think a lot of times, you know, the you communicate a lot but by what you're doing yourself, right? So if, mm -hmm. as, a, as an employer, we're not doing the things we're asking the people we contract with to do, they don't take it as seriously as well, right? Like, mm -hmm. you guys aren't doing the same. You know, like, how serious do they really mean that when they 
So it's just good to know. Um, the, and I just uh, had, I thought it was an interesting uh, data point in your presentation because today's Equal Pay Day, which is the day white women uh, have to work into 2018 to earn what the white men earned in 2017. Um, and I thought it was interesting that even though 47% of the work hours are performed by um, minority-owned businesses, that they're, right, the money from the contracts is, ranges between 3% and 15%. So, um, so I think there's a lot of work to do just globally on a lot of the issues we're talking about today. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, and I, the, the, the hope is that we'll, we'll, we'll be able to gather enough data um, uh, for uh, us to have a, a discussion about the, the appropriate levels uh, of what our ask will be of vendors. Um, so we're, we're, we're hopeful that once we have a, enough data uh, for council to decide. And just uh, two points of clarification as well. So the prioritized database that Mark spoke about was informed by the EEO report that we filed in the fall. So I started July of 2017, and one of the first reports I had to do, um, thanks to the input of Sarah of uh, HR, who was wonderful and kind of guiding me through that initial process, from that we knew whom we were underutilizing. Mm -hmm. um, if sworn officers, non-sworn, our, our entire employee. So from that is what I used to create what I call the social equity affirmative action prioritized uh, individual and organization list. And so I went and looked for Native American organizations, Asian Pacific Islanders, uh, Latinx, Hispanic, uh, biracial, multiracial, African American Caribbean, uh, the whole diaspora from the Middle Eastern diaspora, any organization. So literally, currently there's uh, 56 organizations uh, within that. So mm -hmm. everything from the Divine Nine, AKA Black Greeks, to <laughs> anyone who I can send that information to and then encourage them to send that in their spheres of influence. So I was doing that just from the human resources open position vacancies. Right. And then as we started this assessment, it, the light bulb went off of why wouldn't we send out IFBs, so you know, invitation for proposals, okay. and or uh, we just sent one out today, a request for contractors um, out of our lead. So a big piece of this, and, and we hear your frustration, and in true transparency, um, Charlie, Hillary, and I have, have put in more hours in this, and we are frustrated as well, um, just because um, and to answer your question, Councilman Majors, there wasn't necessarily a sign, from my experience, there wasn't assigned individuals to do some of this work. And so if you don't have a responsible party mm -hmm. for it, how can there be pre-planning, follow through, accountability, a visual map of the process, a narrative of the process, which are all things we've been putting together just since December 4th. So what you're looking at is work that's been done essentially since then. Um, so we, we are flawed, we are working, we are trying to figure this out. A big piece of it is that we have a decentralized procurement process. Right. And so because of that, you know, departments have been able to do their own thing. Uh, one of the things that Mark has said consistently for the last couple months is, I don't know, we had anywhere from three to six entities each buying water. So potentially that's wasted money, but on the other hand, if we stay in that kind of a model, then if we had this type of guidance, then hopefully each one of those under 5,000 or under 10,000 kind of contracts could go to more of these diverse businesses. Okay. Um, and that's also the second point, which is it's been a true initiative and I think will actually be groundbreaking for us and put the city on the map in terms of truly using the acronyms, all of them, right? So um, in this report, it may look like we're condensing them all for DBE and we will definitely get you those numbers to be broken down, um, but most people don't even know that there's an LGBTBE certification, like lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, business enterprise. There's a third entity, the National Gay Lesbian uh, Association, which does that. So one of our recommendations ended up being, we need to get out of the certification business as the city of Harrisburg, because it was only a local certification that you couldn't take anywhere else. Yes, it was free, and who was doing that? There was one small business where Charlie and I each gave about 16 to 20 hours in a week of business development, 
and trying to help a small business gain just what they needed to do as a business. So the LLC, put your documents on a flash drive, basic business development things just to get them positioned to then try to apply for the certification. Mm -hmm. And that happened to be what Charlie was doing as another duty as assigned. He was not business development person yet, and he was not the lead of MBEWBE. So I think we need to and both this. We need to hold that there wasn't always a responsible party for these things. And if there was, they weren't doing these deep dives of data, narrative, visual mapping, holding meetings with multiple departments, and things that we're doing now. Okay. Um, and that we intend to continue to do. So I just think it's important that you know we are using many acronyms, women-owned business, um, service-disabled veteran business, disabled-owned business. I mean, there's about six, and all of those have third entities where they can be certified. And that's what we'll, you will click on the link, that they'll click on that link. If you already have a certification, it'll be an easy, seamless doc vendor form that they will fill out. They will attach their third-party certification and then they're in the process. Um, if they don't have a certification, then now they can start that process. Um, and the other piece of that with vendor was that you can be a vendor for the city of Harrisburg and not have been cross-referenced with mercantile license uh, or accounting office or anything. So what we're really trying to do is even expand our vendors specifically who will be MBE, WBE, LGBTBE, small business certified by doing that whole process. So there's just a lot of different arms, legs, limbs that are going into this. And the biggest piece of it is education. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Have, Johnson. Uh, are these, so is this, these numbers are looking at total procurement, right? Right. Are you talking to snapshot? Yes. Snapshot, total procurement. For just a three year span. And A to yes. G. From A to G. A to G. <laughs> yes. Let me make sure we're looking at total, be outside of contract, like all aspects of procurement. Is it, these are on a vendor list, whoever got paid. Basically. Whoever got paid. Okay. <laughs> whoever got paid. Mm -hmm. whoever got paid. But we, we, there were some, obviously, that. We, we, some people are assigned vendors as a vendor that aren't really vendors in that in the, in the mm -hmm. sense that we're we're talking about. So we weed some of that out. But this is whoever got paid. Okay. And, and the numbers right right now, I mean, Mark said they're not reliable. But for for example, in Wallace Montgomery, that comes in, that's a W, so we can get to that. But uh, you saw the Wallace Montgomery contract, almost four hundred thousand dollars, about what fifty eight thousand went to our right, which is uh, an M M B. Um, in the report that he's putting together, it, it'll just show Walt Montgomery, mm -hmm. a non minority getting a $400,000 contract. So those numbers are skewed um, in a good, well, in a good way. They're very conservative. When we start drilling out into those details, mm -hmm. um, it, it jumps up. Then when you start drilling down even further and you look at um, sub, subcontractors and things like that, um, so we have to really drill down into the numbers to get a true sense of what's actually happening out there. And also just want to make sure that Hillary Green should get a lot of credit. So Hillary really spearheaded this part, like the initial data analysis. And as we all know, wonderfully, uh, she went out on maternity leave. And so she would be the third person up here um, to the left and the right of our business administrator. So she's done an incredible amount of work and actually, to her credit, has answered a few emails <laughs> in the last 72 hours, okay. um, letting us know criteria and how she kind of set this database up so that Charlie and I can continue to run with it and drill. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I thank you all. You know, it's very informative, and I appreciate that. And I'd like to see you back here in a couple of weeks to see what the numbers are, if you don't mind. A couple months? Weeks. Uh, weeks. <laughs> weeks. I think you said weeks. <laughs> weeks. <laughs> no, but I, again, this is a team effort. Um, uh, and I appreciate that. Really, um, uh, I'm pleased that uh, we're able to have level of expertise that we have here in order to get these numbers to you. I'm going to, much to the chagrin, I'm going to be relying on them often, and, um, and we'll, we'll come back to you as, as often as we can. Our, our, we really want to get to the numbers and make sure that we can an, do an analysis that's appropriate and can let you and have accurate. them and be and able accurate. to. Let's just say okay. four weeks. I think it's fair for a four weeks. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Give me an update yeah. in a couple weeks, and you can come back another two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then update in two weeks. Yes. Thank you. And in front of you in four. Yeah.
Just clarifying. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a good evening. Moving on to courtesy of the floor at this moment. Uh, anyone to my right would like to come to the mic, please do so now. Anyone in the middle? Okay. Good evening, Sheila Dow Ford, 2033 Bellevue Road, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, I just wanted to, um, to thank City Council and to thank um, um, Mark Woolley and his, and his team for uh, providing their presentation today. Just a brief update in my capacity as the Executive Director of Impact Harrisburg. I've had the opportunity to meet with Mark twice since um, our meeting here. And um, we have um, talked extensively about um, um, really a concerted effort, a concerted commitment to um, participation, increasing participation levels. A couple of points I'd just like to make very briefly. The first is that Impact Harrisburg at its, um, at a recent meeting of its, one of its committees um, did have a recommendation that will go to our full board this coming Tuesday to hire a compliance manager who will look specifically at what I'm going to call for the sake of this discussion, MBE participation, which will take in the range of, of, of categories. And so um, I wanted you to know that that will be um, a point of discussion at our meeting this coming Tuesday. And um, I have an expectation that the board, I don't know, it's the board that votes, but given um, the sentiment of the board that the board will vote in fact to have a compliance person brought on for the purpose of really working with, um, with Mark and, and um, with um, um, Wayne and on the Third Street project to really uh, be able to do a deeper dive around some of the numbers and to also provide some creativity and um, a communication link between our respective organizations. I think that's important um, because communication is a critical link here. Um, and then finally, I wanted to say that with respect to the segmentation um, the, the question of how you actually do um, segment the, um, the categories. I know that on the um, state disparity study, I have some degree of familiarity with it, and that they are, in fact, um, really doing a, a greater level of segmentation on that study, and that I know that for the city of Harrisburg, that is very important, that we know. And so we will um, commit to bringing you the information. You know, Impact Harrisburg is a... Um, constituent part of the city of Harrisburg, of the community of Harrisburg, and so um, the work that we do is in behalf of the of the community as a whole. So we will be reporting back to you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at any time. Just feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and thank you, Ms. Ford. And I, I was going to give you the courtesy of, of informing the public about uh, what impact Harrisburg has done as far as reached out and, in fact, to hire a consultant. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Woolley, would you be willing to work with that consultant that they are going to hire? Sure. Okay. Just want to have that on record. Thank you. Moving on, anyone else in the middle, please? Les Ford, 2033 Bellevue Road, longtime resident of the city and someone who's been involved in this process relative to the recovery plan, um, the strong plan, um, as long as anyone in this room, I imagine. But my history goes back a little further than that, so therefore let me start with the opening of the meeting and the moment of silence concerning the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. I think it is appropriate that this city would struggle with this issue in a more realistic way at this point, this particular issue being employment of minorities and unrepresented people, because that was the very reason that King was assassinated. So there is a long history. There is a timeline that is incredibly long. And I think this city needs to make a statement, a commitment to moving this proposition forward. Uh, both through numbers, but also through a gut-level commitment to getting this done. 
Going back 50 years, uh, we have also in that era not only Dr. King, but Jesse Jackson, who used to say something that got on my nerves, but I'm going to repeat it because it bears repeating and there is an element of truth, it's a kernel of truth. And what he would say on many occasions is that all boats rise with the tide. The small dinghies, the great ocean liners, the fishing boats, they all rise with the tide. Here we are in Harrisburg, and we are seeing a rising tide in Harrisburg, an economic rising tide in Harrisburg. Isn't that what all of this is about, this strong plan is about? We are under the mandate of the courts to, to clean up our act. And we have a very real opportunity here based on what's happening with examples like the courthouse, with what is it happening with a strong plan putting us in a financial position to take on additional responsibility for all of our citizens, economic responsibility. So I think it's very meaningful that we started out with a moment of silence and remembrance. I think it is very important that we talked about the strong plan because we are an agent of the court at this point. When I say we, loosely speaking, uh, impact Harrisburg and the city administration. We have been directed to do this. So this is an opportunity for us to follow through and obey the law of the land. Again, we had discussion tonight about why are we doing this? We are doing this because it's the law of the land. So let's not half step and get too involved in the minutia of slicing and dicing and categorizing uh, the particulars. It is the law of the land, and we are, as an entity of the state, obliged to do this. So I'll sit down now. I am back. I took a hiatus, uh, but I enjoy, I enjoy being back in this forum. And I can't think of a more appropriate reentry than to once again emphasize that this is not new. This struggle has been going on for 200 plus years. This particular emphasis on economic opportunity for everyone in this city. We may not be able to control the state, the country. We may argue about internationalism versus isolationism, but everybody in this city ought to have an equal opportunity to earn a living and pay taxes back so that we can make this city a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the middle, please? Anyone to my left? Hearing none, we'll move on with the agenda. Approval of minutes, approval of the legislative session minutes of March 27, 2018. Council members, are there any deletions, corrections, or omissions? Hearing no response, minutes will stand as such. Moving on to report to committee, report from Jared, Chair Johnson on the work session of April 3rd, 2018. Mr. Johnson, are you ready with your report? Yes. On April 3rd, 2018, um, the Building and House Committee to discuss Resolution 25 of 2018, which is a resolution authorizing the City of Harrisburg to enter into a random of agreement with Smart City Media LLC for the purpose of implementing a media program consisting of approximately 25 digital kiosks, which will be placed in designated areas in the city. Um, <coughs> we had a representation from the administration, um, Wayne, the city engineer, um, who gave an overview of the smart city media um, kiosk that they're looking to present, uh, looking to install here inside the city. Um, they were looking to install 25 kiosks, which um, installation costs can range to $100,000 per kiosk, which would be um, paid for by smart city media. Um, and their goal is to help make city smarter, safer, and better connected by using city post smart media platforms to deliver helpful Harrisburg focused content, content through interactive digital kiosks and mobile applications. Um, we reviewed the Miranda, memorandum of, um, of agreement and there will be no cost to the city for these kiosks. Um, the, some of the content that can be seen on the kiosks um, that the city have chosen to um, go about pursuing would be um, through on one government information, um, different events that will be happening inside the city, um, ADA best access, um, some information on city history, um, best restaurants, arts and culture, attractions, 
kids, kids and family, shopping, and hotels and accommodation. And these kiosks are also would be available in different languages. Some of the languages include English, Spanish, French, Arabic, German, um, Italian, Vietnamese, um, Napoli, Nepali, um, Swahili, Mandarin. Um, so it's, it allows for our diverse community to interact and um, participate uh, with this kiosk throughout the city. Um, with their um, real-time mobile broadcast, um, they're able to have um, mobile apps be um, applicable to this um, kiosk, where you can also gain access to some of the listed um, um, categories that I discussed earlier. So you're able to um, download this, um, a City Post app, where you can interact not just through the um, kiosk itself, but on the app. Um, um, a point of that was talked about during the meeting. Um, they're looking to focus on installing these app in the downtown and midtown area. Um, it is my hope, and I, I think as well as my um, council members, that um, that this that Smart Cities um, considers installing um, this app in other areas of the community as well, such as um, along Allison Hill and Uptown corridors. Um, there's 25 of them, which could be. Um, provide some essential information such as um, bus routing information. Um, it also provides a uh, ways destination of how to get to one place to another but actual interactive map. Um, so it's our hope um, from this council that um, that we connect with the city smart cities app and we continue to push for um, some of these kiosks to be installed um, outside of downtown and midtown so it's inclusive of all of our neighborhoods. Um, with that, um, I do recommend for us to vote on this resolution today, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Moving on to Chair Matson, who is not here tonight, but he will give his report at the next legislative session, which is April 27, 2018. Moving on to report from Chair Majors on a work session of April 3rd, 2018. Mr. Majors, are you ready to report? Yes, I am, President Williams. Uh, on April 3rd, 2018, the Public Works Committee met to consider Resolution 29 of 2018, a resolution authorizing the City of Harrisburg <coughs> to enter into an aerial easement agreement with South Third Development LLC for the purpose of string lighting, stringing light, light, excuse me, stringing lights in the public right of way over South Third Street between Market and Chestnut Street. We received a uh, presentation from Brad Jones who gave us an overview. Currently, the city previously approved uh, the stringing of the lights in the uh, Soma uh, area, south of Market area along 3rd Street. Uh, this was to make the lights permanent. We had a brief presentation. The lights are currently up now. They use them for uh, a series of events throughout uh, the year and uh, have them lit, lit up uh, for a certain amount of time. Uh, we worked, we talked to them about um, if there were any issues that any of the residents in the area had. Um, they informed us that there were some initially, but they have all the lights on a timer now, so they do go off at a designated time. So any residents that are in that area uh, won't be affected at, uh, at night when they're trying to sleep. Uh, and with that, we didn't have too many comments from members of council, and I would ask for my fellow council members to approve Resolution 29 of 2018. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Majors. Moving on to report from Chair Wims on the work session of April 3rd, 2018. The administration committee conducted business at the city council work session on April 3rd, 2018. The topic of the discussion was to reappoint three individuals to the license and tax appeal board. Resolution 37 addresses Ms. Evelyn Hunt. Resolution 38 was Ms. Stacy Bayshore. And resolution 39 was Mr. Dan Shoulder, Esquire. Now each of the appointees was given five minutes to inform council of who they were and that why they would like to continue to serve on this particular board. After a brief questioning period, as the chair, I am recommending that the three appointees be voted in the affirmative for reappointment to the License and Tax Appeal Board. All three possess a wealth of experience and knowledge in the taxation area, and I would like to thank the appointees for giving of their time to assist the city by continuing to serve on the License and Tax Appeal Board. I will ask that each of my council members vote in the firm to, to reappoint the three individuals. And that's the end of my report as well. Moving on to ordinance for first reading. Mr. Petrosky, please read Bill 3, 2018 in the record. 
Uh, Bill 3 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Major, second by Ms. Green. It's an ordinance amending and reorganizes part three of Title IX of the codified ordinances of the City of Harrisburg entitled the Municipal Waste and Recycling Code to reflect enhancements to the city's collection and management, solid waste, recycle, and composting materials to improve efficiencies in the collection of residential municipal waste fees by in instituting annual billing to provide a discount period to identify prohibited acts which constitute violations of this code and the strengthen, strengthen enforcement of the code by authorizing the use of enforcement officers and establishing fines and penalties for violations of this code. Thank you. That would be placed in Public Works Committee. Moving on to ordinance for amendment. We have none this evening. Moving on to ordinance for final passage, Bill 2 of 2018. Bill 2 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Allett, second by Ms. Williams. It's an ordinance approving the acceptance of loan funding by the City of Harrisburg from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation Infrastructure Bank in the amount of $2 million for the purpose of restoring, repairing, and improving streets within the city situated in South Harrisburg, including accessibility upgrades relating to Americans with Disabilities Act comp compliance. So any questions or comments on Bill 2? Hearing none, please call the vote, Mr. Petrosky. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Bill 2 passes. Thank you. Moving on to resolutions, resolution 25, 2018. Resolution 25, 2018 was moved by Mr. Madsen, seconded by Ms. Williams. It's a resolution authorizing the City of Harrisburg to enter into a memorandum of agreement with Smart City Media LLC for the purpose of implementing a media program consisting of approximately 25 digital kiosks which will be placed in designated areas in the city of Harrisburg. So any questions or comments on resolution 25? I just have one comment. One thing I forgot to include inside my report is um, this also is a revenue driver for the city. Um, the, the, the way this um, smart city uh, makes money off of these kiosks is through different advertisements. Um, and then the city gets a certain percentage of those advertisement sales through the kiosks. Um, so this is also a revenue driver. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 25 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 29. Resolution 29 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Majors, <coughs> seconded by Ms. Williams. It's a resolution authorizing the City of Harrisburg to enter into an aerial easement agreement with South Third. Development LLC for the purpose of stringing lights in the public right away over South Third Street between Market Street and Chestnut Street. So any questions or comments, council members? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Hallett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 29 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 32. Resolution 32 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Hallett, seconded by Ms. Williams. It's a resolution the City of Harrisburg to enter into and execute a loan agreement and related documents for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Transportation Infrastructure Bank in the amount of $2 million for the purpose of restoring, repairing, and improving streets within the city situated in South Harrisburg, including accessibility upgrades relating to Americans with Disabilities Act compliance and authorizing the mayor, controller, engineer, and solicitor to execute such documents as are necessary to accept the award and otherwise finalize the loan on behalf of the city. Any questions or comments, council members? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 32 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 35. Resolution 35, 2018 was moved by Mr. Madsen, seconded by Mr. Allett. It's a resolution approving the preliminary final subdivision and land development plan submitted by Brad Jones, president of River and Pine LLC, to convert an existing office building located at 124 Pine Street into a 25-unit mixed-use building. So any questions or comments, council members? I will personally not be voting on this particular resolution when um, individual developers come into the city, and I requested that uh, we look out for the low-medium-income families. Uh, this is the fourth project that was brought by uh, Mr. Jones until this council has an opportunity to revise the ordinance that would address inclusionary zoning for low-income medium families, I will not be voting for any of those projects. I'm voting now. So I just wanted to give my exp explanation. Any other comments or questions? Please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? 
Yes. Ms. Williams? No. Resolution 35 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 36. Resolution 36 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Madison, seconded by Ms. Williams. It's a resolution approving the preliminary final subdivision and land development plan submitted by Keith Blaisdell of, on behalf of the ABC 27 to consolidate three lots, demolish existing on-site structures, construct in addition and reconfigure existing parking at the properties located at 3235 Hoffman Street and 560 Ulrich Street. Any questions, comments on Resolution 36? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 36 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 37. Resolution 37 of 2018 was moved by Ms. Williams, seconded by Mr. Johnson. It's a resolution reappointing Ms. Evelyn Hunt to serve on the License and Tax Appeal Board. Any questions or comments, council members? Please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 37 passes. Moving on to Resolution 38. Resolution 38 of 2018 was moved by Ms. Williams, seconded by Mr. Johnson. It's a resolution reappointing Ms. Stacy Basinger to serve on the License and Tax Appeal Board. Any questions or comments? Please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 38 passes. Moving on to Resolution 39. Resolution 39 of 2018 was moved by Ms. Williams, seconded by Mr. Johnson. It's a resolution reappointing Mr. Dan A. Shoulder, uh, Esquire, to serve on the License and Tax Appeal Board. Any questions or comments, Council Members? Going pretty fast, aren't you? <laughs> I just wanted to say you were like, wow. <laughs> Any questions or comments, Councilman? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mr. Daniels? Yes. Mr. Green? I'm Mr. Green, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 39 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 46. Resolution 46 of 2018 was moved by Ms. Williams, seconded by Mr. Johnson. It's a resolution approving the preliminary final subdivision and land development plan submitted by Scott Dunwoody on behalf of Bethesda Mission to construct a new larger women's shelter for the Bethesda Mission located at 818 North 20th Street. I would be placed in Economic Development Committee. Council members, any old business this evening? Any new business, Council members? Mr. Majors? Just, just want to make two uh, announcements. Uh, just one for the public. I've been getting a lot of inquiries from folks about when leaf collection would resume. I uh, just want to let them know. I know an announcement went out through our communications, but uh, leaf in yard waste collection will resume on May 1st, 2018 on your scheduled street cleaning day. And prior to that, if you have any leaves that are already leaves in yard waste that are bagged up, you can feel free to bring them down to 1820 Paxton Street, our public okay. works facility. Um, and the second announcement is uh, as we read into uh, the record, the bill for first consideration was uh, the trash ordinance bill, excuse me, yeah, bill three of 2018. Uh, in the coming weeks, we'll be announcing a series of meetings that will be held uh, in the community to discuss the sanitation ordinance. It has not been updated in quite a long time, and there are a lot of significant changes that are being proposed. So we want to make sure that the public is aware. Uh, and during our next legislative meeting, I, between that now and then, we will work on developing a series of meetings. And at the next legislative session, we'll make sure to publicize them fully. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Majors, uh, do you know if they have any uh, additional bags for the leaf collection uh, at I, the location? I do not. Works? I would. I will check. I do not believe that okay. there are additional bags at the public works facility, but I will. I can check. Okay, because I've, I've been asked by the couple of residents in the city of Harrisburg. Okay, thank you. Any other new business council members? Um, I got two quick announcements. Um, first, I want to um, announce and also congratulate about the uh, AAU's traveling sports team that started here in Harrisburg. It's called Pennsylvania Stars. Um, it's actually a, a combination of local peewee um, football players from the Baby Cougars, Swatera Tigers, um, Susquehanna Indians. Um, I think there may be a, be a player from Stilton as well. So they're actually um, going to go play down in Maryland um, the, four, the 14th and 15th of this weekend. Um, so that's a very, very exciting thing um, for the Central PA area. There's never been a traveling AAU football team before. 
Um, I think there's going to be some more information coming out to the public, but I wanted to be the first to congratulate um, those coaches, in particular um, Dwayne Mallard, for stepping up and um, organizing this and um, exposing our youth to something greater um, within um, the city of Harrisburg. Um, so look out for more information on that. And I also um, want to um, congratulate um, a fellow council member of mine who um, is not going to come back the same when he comes back <laughs> to our meeting. He's actually going to be a married man, um, <laughs> councilman Westburn Majors. Um, just as a, outside of being just a, a colleague, he's a personal friend. Um, and I know um, his wife or his wife to be. Um, so they're going to be a happily married um, couple this weekend. So I want to congratulate you. Um, I know my the rest of the council members yes. um, share my sentiments. Yes. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Me being probably the, oh, well, I guess David's single. Me and David are only single men left. I'm actually going to make sure I spend some time with Wes to make sure, <laughs> <laughs> you know, before he um, changes his ways on me. But um, I just as a, you know, I look to Wes as a big brother. So I'm really, really proud of him. And he just keeps paving the way. So congratulations. Good Thank you. Thank congratulations. You. Thank you. And that's all I have. Any other new business council members? Hearing none, I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a second. Second. Meetings adjourned.